opening text is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. The Apostle Paul writes, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. I have, in re I have in recent weeks been challenging you regarding where your heart is. And if it is as it should be as a follower of Jesus. And today I'm following up with a recent message and calling this one Heart Check 2. Heart Check 2. Thought crossed my mind early this week and it's been on my heart all week. And that's kind of the focus of today's message is where are we now two years into this as they call it, pandemic. The past couple of years have been a challenging time for all of us worldwide. I don't think anybody would argue that. It has been a time if we even allowed ourselves to see where our heart is. If you were to look back over the past couple of years, being honest with yourself and with God, I mean, you know, you can look back and not be honest with yourself or be honest with God about things. Mm -hmm. But if you're honest with yourself and with God, what have you learned about yourself these past couple of years? Has the past couple of years shown you to be a true follower of Jesus and his word? Or has it exposed you as someone other than a follower of Jesus? In today's opening passage, the Apostle Paul instructs us to examine ourselves to see if we are even in the faith, something that we should do frequently. All over the country, there are churches, Christian leaders, and personalities that promote a Jesus and a gospel message that is not biblically sound. Oh, they may use scripture to support their version of Jesus and the gospel message, but let us not forget that when Satan tempted Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, that he also used scripture. But it was twisted and taken out of context in an attempt to trip Jesus up. I heard it said a long time ago that the best lie is one that is 99% true. There are many different versions of Jesus and the gospel message that are being actively promoted from behind pulpits, and many people are embracing them because they are not searching the scriptures for themselves, believing that what they are being told, what they are being taught, is true and accurate biblically. Some of these false versions of Jesus and the gospel message are identified by commonly known phrases, and I'll just list a few just to kind of get us on a page, <laughs> same page. <clears throat> Some of these have been known as the prosperity gospel, word of faith, or name it and claim it, positive confession, kingdom now, and the dominion theology. There's one that I have identified over the past couple of years as what I call patriotic Christianity, where the heritage, the mindsets, and morals of America's past become the lens by which some view Christianity, not realizing that the two conflict with each other in multiple ways. Some have so embraced this patriotic Christianity that without realizing it, and they would argue this, they have made biblical Christianity subservient to patriotic Christianity. Up until a couple years ago, a patriotic Christianity would have never been considered or imagined or even seen as conflicting with biblical Christianity. But the past two years has made it stand out loud and clear with few seeing the contracts, the contrast and the conflicts between the two. Have you guys seen that too? Or is it just me? <laughs> 
The focus of today's message is not so much on the many false teachings that are being boldly proclaimed these days, but instead to encourage us to examine ourselves if we are truly following Jesus and his word, the Bible. Some may question if that is really important for me to do, and, and it is. For example, you may, you may have a Ferrari that needs to be serviced. But if you think that you can go to the Ford dealership down the street and expect him to service it and service it correctly, you're going to be profoundly mistaken, profoundly disappointed to find out that they can't, and if they try, they're going to miserably fail in that process. Why? Because they don't have the right tools. Why? Because they don't have the right knowledge. They don't have the right understanding. They don't have the understandings of how a Ferrari works versus your basic Ford. Just because people are filling church pews or standing behind a pulpit does not mean you are accurately embracing the Jesus, the true Jesus of the Bible, and what the Bible has to say for followers of Jesus. And that can potentially have eternal consequences if you do not change course. I have mentioned several times in the past, and I will mention it again, that we are told in Proverbs, 6, uh, Proverbs 14, verse 12, and Proverbs 16, 25, that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Let me re repeat that. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Be careful if you are embracing teachings and teachers that tickle your ears and tell you things that match up with your own opinion of how things should be for followers of Jesus. Be careful, because it could lead you to an eternal destination from God in hell and the lake of fire instead of the heaven you were expecting. There's many people, I believe, that fill the pews of churches, at least in America, that think that they are headed to heaven, but they are not embracing the Jesus of the Bible and living according to sound biblical doctrine. And they're going to be rudely awakened and disappointed when they find themselves on the other side of eternity. Among the many false teachings that have invaded our churches, and there are many, two of them, there are, there are two that are being ignored. Sin and Bible prophecy. Many churches do not address sin, why we need a Savior, and how that Jesus alone can save us from our sins. How many of you know that is a dangerous place to be in? If you are not realizing um, the reality of sin, you don't realize and understand your need of a Savior, how that's, you are bound and dead in sin, and how that Jesus alone, not O Buddha, not O Muhammad, not um, uh, the New Age movement or yoga or whatever, none of that is going to get you to heaven. It's not going to bring you true peace, maybe a form of tranquility, but it will not give you peace on the inside. Because it's not, they're, they're not dealing with sin. We have to deal with sin in our life. We have to realize we are bound to sin. And if we don't deal with that issue, we don't acknowledge that issue, then are we really followers of Jesus? Or thinking we're walking along with Jesus or something like that? Also, many churches hardly, if at all, mention Bible prophecy, namely Bible end-time prophecies. For, and that could be for any number of reasons or excuses. As a result, there are many filling churches, pews, that are unprepared for what the Bible tells us is coming. And worse yet, they do not even know how to be prepared and to keep their garments clean in anticipation of Jesus' ever so imminent return for his followers. Can you say that you are aware of what the Bible prophetically tells us is coming in these last days? Or, how, or even how we can know that we are in the last days? Do you, do you know that? Can, are you aware of that? 
And can you say that you know how to be prepared for when Jesus returns and to not be caught off guard and unprepared like the five foolish virgins recorded in Matthew 25, 1 through 13? <clears throat> Let me read that parable. It's the parable that of the ten virgins. Jesus is talking <laughs> And he says, <clears throat> Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. <clears throat> but the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, the five foolish ones, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. <laughs> How can we be prepared for Jesus' return if we do not know that he's returning, one, and two, we're not, we don't even know what it means to be prepared. And part of that preparation is how do we deal with sin in our life? Not just the sin that brings, that we have going into salvation, but sin that we find ourselves uh, committing after we've experienced salvation. How do we deal with that? That's all part of being prepared. Being prepared is more than just acknowledging that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and accepting Jesus as your Savior. But it also involves steering clear of sin in one's life. There are many passages that identify sin. The first of which is when we do not love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. The first and greatest commandment mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 22, 34 through 40. I'm going to go ahead and read that. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So right there is the one sin that we tend to forget and not even pay attention to. If we are not loving him with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. But what about other sins? In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, we are given a list of behaviors that would be considered sin. Behaviors that we are told those who practice them will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's what we call the, the, um, a list of the works of the flesh. Let me read that. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, <clears throat> outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like 
of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> I've mentioned in, in the past an experience from way back when some new Christians in our college group, um, they were dating and uh, uh, a group of us were at a restaurant on the main street in the, in that goes through town where I grew up and <clears throat> it's a cruise strip. It's a lot of cruising. A movie was made about it and all, but we were there, we were getting ready to do some street witnessing and, and the restaurant was next to a hotel. And we happened to spot this, these new Christians, boy and girl, college age, drive into the hotel parking lot and get a room. One of the girls in our group um, approached the girl about it later, and she did it in a loving, respectful way, and just mentioned to her that, you know, we saw you going into the hotel room, just wanted you to know that that, that is fornication, and that is considered a sin in the sight of God. And, and, they, and her response was, wow, I, we didn't know that. And so they abstained until they got married sometime later. Praise God, right? But you know what's sad is <clears throat> I recently became aware of someone that has been going to church for several years and has been involved in fornication. And I know of others who have been involved in fornication or adultery in and still are active members and participants in a church, not just here, but in other places. And they think there's nothing wrong with it. Why? Because they're not being taught about sin and the fact that they need to deal with sin in their life and to stay clear of it. And that is sad. How can they be prepared for when Jesus returns? They may be looking for Jesus to return, but if they're not being taught about sin and dealing with sin in their life, how prepared are they really? Right? In that list, we've got adultery, fornication, we've got sorcery, we've got hatred, we've got people who are contentious, jealous, people who have outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, people who are causing dissension in that list. You know, I, I, I was thinking about the, this list, and one of the things that I was reminded of <clears throat> was, you know, a lot of people, there are people that feel they're, they're in their elderly years and they are, you know, people look at them like you are angry, bitter people. You are always angry. You're always mad. And I'm reminded of when I was going through a period of time and I it boiled up within me just an anger towards someone and what they were doing. And, and it felt good. It was like, it was almost like an adrenaline rush and God stopped me and says, that's what happens is people get used to that adrenaline rush and they become addicted to it. Like people get addicted to drugs or other stuff. And, and he, and he showed me how that, that is why some of these people that are in elderly and older in their years, they are stuck. They've been addicted to anger so much so that they will even create scenarios that will create anger. They will find ways to be angry when there is no reason because they are addicted to it. They're bound by it. They know it. They don't like it, but they're trapped. And the only way that they can be set free of it is through the power of God's Holy Spirit and the working of God in their life. Praise God, right? So when we look at this list of what the Bible refers to as the fruit of the flesh... How many of these are seen in your life? Notice how that Paul mentions that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who practice these things, they are part of their life. They're not trying to change. They are, 
They may be making excuses. They may be rationalizing. They may not be putting forth any effort. They may not even care. And they're allowing these things to be a part of their life. He is referring to people that exhibit such behaviors as a way of life, especially if they tend to make excuses or rationalize why it is okay for them, as if they are exempt from the eternal consequences Paul mentions. Well, that's just my personality. That's just the way I am. And Paul says, yeah, well, maybe that's the case, but you realize if you're going to continue practicing that, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. He does, you know, and that's the one thing. We, we have a lot of people that say, well, that's my personality. That's the way I was raised. That's the way I've always been. That's just me. Nowhere will you find in Scripture that that gives a license for us to continue in sin and wrong, ungodly behavior. God does not look at our personalities and judge on a curve. You guys realize that? Sin is sin. Ungodly behavior is ungodly behavior. Unrighteousness is unrighteousness. It doesn't matter what your personality is. God can change and God can work within your personalities, but you got to realize, okay, that's the way I've always been. That's the way I was raised. That's me. But you have to come to terms and say, okay, God, but I know that that's not right in your sight. I need you to change that in me. And sadly, many times, people are more content with being who they are and being the way they've always been or whatever than submitting those areas in their life that does not line up with God's word and allowing God to change that in them. Going back to where we started today, how many of these things did you find yourself exhibiting over the past couple of years, even though they were not seen in your life beforehand? Did you find yourself hating people for the things they said or did? <clears throat> Were you contentious with people who do not share your same opinions and sentiments? Did you have outbursts of wrath? Were you divisive with others? Were you caught up with selfish ambitions, even to the point of having ill words and, or behaviors against those who interfered with your selfish ambitions in some way? Sadly, I have seen Christians quote unquote, who never really exhibited such behaviors before. And some who had even condemned such behaviors in the past begin to exhibit them these past couple of years. And it makes me wonder how true their relationship with Jesus is. That's, you know, that, that's the thing that this past couple of years has done, you know, among many other things, it has <clears throat> caused, um, the hearts of people to be exposed more than ever before. Would you guys agree to that? Yeah. You, you, you know, someone that you thought was a particular way, then the past couple of years with all that we've been going through, you find a whole nother side of that person that you never knew existed. So looking back over the past two years, what have you discovered about yourself? Not about others, about yourself. Would you pass the test of being a true follower of Jesus? Or would you find that you have fallen short in that area? Again, in the opening text, the Apostle Paul is instructing us to examine ourselves. Why? To see if we are truly in the faith. And I want to encourage each of us here, as well as those listening on radio, or watching online by video to examine yourselves. Are you where you need to be? If you find that you have been falling short of passing the test of a true follower of Jesus, the good news is that you can change that and become a true follower of Jesus. To begin with, we are told in 1 John 1 verse 9, 1 John 1 9, that if we confess our sins, and he is speaking of Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that a good thing? 
If we get caught up in a sin, if we will confess it to the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Now, granted, if we're just saying, okay, God, I did this, blah, 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 blah. We're telling him what we did, but we really don't have a heart of repentance. We really don't acknowledging that it was wrong, but we're just confessing it to him to say, you know, he, the passage is talking about people who have a heart of repentance that are saying, God, I'm sorry. I did it. I blew it. I need you to forgive me. That's what it's about. Even though we have become a new creation at salvation, we are all tempted or fall into the traps of sin on occasion. But if we confess our sins with a repentant heart, instead of making excuses or rationalizing them away, Jesus said he will forgive us. And that is very good news for all of us as we embark on this journey as a follower of and an ambassador for Jesus. Amen. Earlier, we looked at the fruit of the flesh and how that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But let us now look at what the fruit of the spirit of God looks like in the life of a follower of Jesus. In Galatians chapter five, verse 22 through 26, we are given a list of attributes and behaviors of those who are led by the spirit of God. Let's go ahead and read that. Galatians five, 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. Provoking one another, envying one another. These are character traits that are to be found in the lives of true followers of Jesus. But like fruit on a fruit tree, these fruits take time to develop and grow. Can you attest to that? It just doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It takes the trials of life, the seasons of that we go through where we are put in situations where our flesh says, I want to respond a certain way. And the spirit of God says, no, I need you to respond this way. And it's when we submit to the spirit of God, that these fruits of the spirit are developed in our lives. But if, you know, we, we go to say or do something and the Holy spirit says, no, you shouldn't do that. You need to respond this way. Or you need to deal with it this way. And we say, yeah, but you know what? I, I think it's my right, or I feel like, or I want to, or I don't care, and I'm going to go with it. The fruit of the Spirit is not being developed. It's more of the fruit of the flesh. We may never be 100% free of the fruit of the flesh, and we may never produce 100% of the fruit of the Spirit all the time, but is the fruit of the flesh disappearing in our lives? while the fruit of the Spirit is becoming more and more a way of life for you? Can you see a positive difference between them over the past two years or even the past six months? One of the things I say that we can look at to gauge if we're growing is, am I doing, submitting, is the fruit of the flesh less evident in my life now as it was six months? months ago and is the fruit of the flesh more prominent in my life than it was six months ago. If it's about the same or if the fruit of the flesh is still strong and growing, then maybe I need to ask myself that there's some things I need to change in my life and in my heart. The question is again asked, is this really important for us to know and to do? Yes, it is. In Titus chapter two, 11 through 14, the passage where we are introduced with the term, the blessed hope, referring to the rapture of the church, the followers of Jesus. We are told that the same grace that brings us salvation is also teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. 
We are told in verse 13, that this is happening while we are looking. In other words, watching for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we are not allowing the Spirit of God and His grace to prepare us for Jesus' return, or if we are not watching for Jesus to return, how prepared will we truly be for Him when He does come? Again, looking back over the past couple of years, do you like what you have seen in yourself the past couple of years? Or are you seeing a need for change in your life? Change that brings you into right alignment with what it means to be a true follower of the Jesus in the Bible. Now is the day. Now is the time to do just that. You see, we are entering a time in world history that is only going to get darker and more godless until Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom here on earth. And if we are not where we need to be in our relationship with Jesus now, it will only be harder to do so later. If we did not pass the test as a follower of Jesus and being in the faith the past couple of years, unless we make changes now, we will fail the test miserably in the coming weeks, months, and years should the Lord tarry in receiving us to himself. There is no time to delay to make sure we are where we ought to be with him. And if we think that we do have time when we are only putting our, if we think that we do have time, then when, uh, then we are only putting ourselves and our eternal destination in severe jeopardy. We've got to be tackling that now. Not half-heartedly, but wholeheartedly. Do we really want to go to heaven? Do we really want relationship with Jesus? Do we really want to be seen as a true follower of Jesus? Or are we content with the way things are? And, and you know, what's more important to us? The way we want to live, our agendas, our goals, our comforts, our desires, or pleasing him and honoring him with our life and being all we can be for him and allowing him and to live through us because why we are dead to ourselves. As Paul said in Galatians 2 20, that he is crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, Christ lives in him and the life he lives is Jesus living through him. Is Jesus living through you the past couple of years? Or was it you? If we are going to embrace, or if we are going to navigate, not embrace, but navigate through the times that are coming, should the Lord tarry, we've got to learn to die to ourselves and to follow him as he would have us to. And to do that, we need to, not just once or twice, but frequently examine test ourselves is our walk with the Lord where it ought to be or are we failing the test of being a true follower of Jesus the times that the church was going through when Paul wrote this was not a fun time a lot of severe persecution the government was very corrupt immoral ungodly Violent, um, immoral. I mean, it was just, it was very bad. And the church back then had to have, be anchored in that they were going to be followers of Jesus no matter what. We are not experiencing at this time close to what they experienced then. And the question is, would we be one that would um, pass the test like they did when we're not even going through what they went through? We need to be committed to that. And so to do that, we need to continually examine ourselves and not just examine ourselves, but ask the Lord the King David did this multiple times. Search me, O God, test my heart. See if there's any wicked thing in me 
and get it out. Don't just examine yourselves because sometimes, how many of you know, we can put a slant on things. We can, we, we can view things from our perspective and think that we're okay or we're, that we're doing fine. But we need to include God in the picture and, out, and ask him, search my heart, God. Is there anything in me that needs to change? Is there anything in me that's not right in your sight? Change that in me. Help me submit to you and allow you to change those things. Like David did. We need to do the same. Again, we need to bring God into the equation because there is a way that seems right unto a man, but it's end, but it ends in death and destruction. We can't just examine ourselves based on what we think. But we have to allow God to come into the picture and direct our thoughts and our perspectives so that we can see things clearly as he sees them. Amen? And with that, let's pray. Father, we just come before you right now. We just thank you for your word. It, it is life to those who will embrace it as life to those that will allow it to take root in their hearts and to change them, to grow into the image of Jesus and to be more Christ-like in all ways. Help us, Father, to remember to examine ourselves through the eyes of Scripture and allow you to search our hearts, not just once or twice, but frequently to see if there's anything in our lives that needs to be changed things that need to be removed from our life, things that needs to be done so that we can honor and please you in all our ways and help us to submit to your leadership, help us to submit to the leading of your spirit, even when we don't want to, even when we don't care, even when we have our own opinions, our rights, whatever. Help us to care and help us to submit and to yield to you and to your spirit and to allow your word to be the standard, the basis by which we identify if we are following Jesus or not. Go with us, watch over us and protect us, draw us closer to you and help us to have divine opportunities to speak into the lives of others. If they don't have a relationship with Jesus, that they can enter into that and if they do, that they will be challenged in their walk with the Lord and be seeking to be prepared for the days that are coming ahead and for our Lord's imminent return. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.